Hello, folks joining us on the webinar and on Facebook. Just waiting for people to file in here this morning before we get going. Okay, um, excellent. So we got uh, we have our panelists here, um, attendees coming in hot. Uh, most of the most of those expected here on Zoom. That's great. Welcome. Um, we're doing a, for those who are on Zoom. We're also doing a Facebook live stream as well, where the majority of our public audience is, is joining us today. So welcome to all those folks joining on Facebook. Um, my name is Simon Ryder Burbage. I am with the Ecology Action Center and also a co-coordinator for the Healthy Base Network. Um, we are bringing you a live public panel today, a virtual press conference to break down the first ever aquaculture review board decision on open net pen finfish farming in Nova Scotia. So we're excited to bring you um, quite a bit of uh, detailed analysis and um, thinking from the coastal communities who are on the, the front lines of a major open net pen um, expansion push that's happening in Nova Scotia today. Um, as most of you have probably seen, uh, the Aquaculture Review Board released uh, its decision on Friday, um, approving a boundary amendment at uh, the Rattling Beach site in the Annapolis Basin. So today's webinar is gonna touch um, partially, on, partially on that decision and also partially on the broader context of the uh, aquaculture landscape here in Nova Scotia and uh, at the national level as well. Um, so I'm gonna be your moderator today. Um, I am called the uh, Ecology Action Center Marine at the moment, which is the team that I work for at the Ecology Action Center. But I also have a real name, and that is Simon Ryder Burbage. Um, so uh, I'm I'm here today basically as a conduit for um, the voices of of uh, the coastal community panelists and um, and the uh, the other panelists that we have here today, not necessarily representing coastal communities, but NGOs who participated in the ARB hearing. Um, so we've got a format where we're going to do like three to five minutes of um, opening statements from each uh, panelist, and then we'll uh, we'll dive into a QA and a uh, following that. Um, for those of you who are joining us on Zoom, we have both a Q&A option for you and a chat option. So um, feel free to use either one of those if you'd like to ask a question at any point. Um, you're welcome to, to jump in at any time if, if something comes up and we can always uh, get to it after the opening statements are complete. Um, for those of you on Facebook, uh, you, you, should see, um, you should see a comment option on the live stream. That's where we'll bring uh, your questions in if you're, if you're um, viewing from Facebook. And um, so we'll, we'll, we have some staff helping us on the other side to uh, kind of filter, filter questions into um, into the into the zoom function here so um a couple of other things to uh touch on before we start uh we are broadcasting today from Mi'kma'ki the unceded uh, territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples um I am here in Chibuktuk Halifax and we have folks um uh streaming live from all across Nova Scotia Mi'kma'ki from all corners of the Nova Scotian mainland um so you'll get to know um who's here from our Healthy Bays Network panel. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Healthy Bays Network, this is a group that came together a couple of years ago um, to ensure that uh, uh, kind of kind of gathering in response to um, project development plans by CIRMAC. And um, we had uh, groups from uh, all across the province um, sort of interested in that development pros proposals proposal and in many cases uh, object uh, objecting. Uh, to those proposals um, forcefully in, in a lot of in a lot of places. So that was kind of the impetus for uh, this group coming together and and we have been such uh, ever since working to uh, protect the, the bays and coastal estuaries of the province from the risks of open net pen aquaculture and other um, yeah and other problems. Um, so that's the potted uh, introduction to the healthy bays network. Um, we are uh, going to hand off hand, hand the mic off to the panelists here in a second to give uh, brief introductions as to who they are, and then we'll talk a little bit further about the Aquaculture Review Board decision before getting into opening statements. Um, 
So without further ado, uh, I'm going to pass the mic off to Derek Purcell, who's joining us from the Twin Bays Coalition. Good morning. My name is Derek Purcell. I'm speaking on behalf of the Twin Bays Coalition, which is a group of concerned citizens in the Mahone Bay and St. Margaret's Bay areas. For more detail, you can check out our website at twinbays.ca. And we have a What's New page that chronicles most of our work. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I grew up spending a lot of time in the fishing community, both on the water and around the water. Uh, that started me on a path to a chemical engineering degree and ultimately a very long career in the Royal Canadian Navy as a Naval Warfare Officer. Two years ago, I got involved with the Twin Bays Coalition and my focus is on the regulatory regime and the approval process for FinFish applications. Thank you. Great, thanks, Derek. Um, next, we'll pass it off to Karen Traversy with the Association for the Preservation of the Eastern Shore. Good morning. <clears throat> I am, uh, am representing the president who could not be here today, Wendy Watson-Smith. Um, I've been involved in coastal issues for quite some time since I retired from the federal government. That would be about 17 years ago. Um, and I represented the um, Coastal Coalition of Nova Scotia on the Dole Leahy panel, the uh, advisory committee and the, and the stakeholders group. Um, I've been working with the um, uh, Association for the Preservation of the Eastern Shore, as it is where I live here in Clam Bay on the Eastern Shore. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next up, we have Brian Muldoon from Protect Liverpool Bay. Good morning. Brian Muldoon here. I'm the founder and chair of Protect Liverpool Bay. We formed our group over three years ago when we heard that... Um, Cook Aquaculture was planning to expand and put almost 2 million fish in our shallow bay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brian. And from the St. Mary's Bay Protectors, we have Gwen Wilson. Oh, you're muted there, Gwen. Uh, good morning. Sorry about that. Um, I'm a resident of Sandy Cove on Digby Neck, which uh, is in the St. Mary's Bay region. And uh, I'm also representative of St. Mary's Bay uh, Protectors. We are a group who formed uh, in 2018-2019 when uh, CIRMAC was exploring their options for St. Mary's Bay. I have been, um, my family has been a resident of this area for over 200 years. And many of those people were involved in the sea in their careers. I was an educator. My first job was in Digby teaching elementary school there. I'm a permanent resident now of the village of Sandy Cove, a major fishing port on the Digby Neck. Thank you. Right on, thank you, Gwen. And Chris Hunter from the Atlantic Salmon Federation. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm Chris Hunter. I work for the Atlantic Salmon Federation um, as a program director for Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. Uh, ASF's mandate is to, uh, it's quite simple, it's to protect, conserve, and restore wild Atlantic salmon. Uh, and my job involves uh, helping to fulfill that mandate by providing support to communities uh, that are interested in, those, in that mandate um, within Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. And last but not least, we have Sarah McDonald with EcoJustice. Hi, everyone. Uh, Sarah McDonald. I'm a staff lawyer with EcoJustice in Halifax. And my colleague, uh, Caitlin Urquhart, and I represented Dr. Hemming, who was the intervener in the uh, Rattling Beach hearing before the Aquaculture Review Board. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So, so welcome to our panelists, and thanks again for being here today. Um, so uh, just a quick, uh, one, one more quick housekeeping note before um, we go on here. Um, I am gonna be doing a few, uh, a couple different tech jobs today, including um, trying to spotlight speakers and uh, keeping an eye on time and what have you. So um, if anybody notices that I'm forgetting one of these tech duties, you can always feel free to let me know in the chat. I'm sure that it will happen at some point. So if you're looking at a box, somebody who is not speaking, um, yeah, just feel free to let me know. And also you will hear from, uh, you may hear in the chat from a couple of other um, uh, panelists who are not necessarily presenting today, but who will be helping to field questions. And that's uh, Marilyn Ketty and uh, Jeff LeBoudelier who are also um, with us at the Healthy Bays Network. 
So you may see them chiming in um, just to help to, yeah, just to help to answer questions, field, uh, field things that we can't necessarily get to. Um, okay, and with that, uh, what's going on here with the Aquaculture Review Board decision? So as I mentioned, uh, on Friday, we had a decision, uh, the first ever to approve um, the expansion of the boundary amendment at, at the Rattling Beach Fish Farm in the Annapolis Basin. Um, this is the first uh, of its kind, the first decision of its kind. Um, so this hearing, uh, we were especially keen on this hearing because it sets precedent for um, all kinds of other uh, fish farm oriented hearings to follow. As some of you know, we have uh, quite a significant backlog um, of these kind of hearings to go through in Nova Scotia at the moment. Um, some of the people on this panel uh, were rejected from intervener, uh, intervener participation during this hearing. Uh, that includes us at the Ecology Action Center, um, the Healthy Bays Network itself as an organization, and, and uh, Gwen and the St. Mary's Bay Protectors. So um, we did try to get more involved than we were ultimately allowed to. We'll touch on that in, in, uh, today. Um, and just a quick uh, note on the board, as some of you probably know, again, um, it was initially envisioned by the Dole Leahy panel um, on, on aquaculture regulations in the aquaculture industry back in 2015. Um, Dole Leahy kind of pitched this uh, independent board to be a place for communities to bring grievances against specific fish farm sites and uh, to consider the revocation of license and, and lease, as well as playing a role in reviewing um, new site applications. So. You know, we're we're sort of um, judging what we saw at the hearing against, uh, yeah, against some of those Dole he um, um, some of those those things that Dole he recommended in their report back in 2015. And finally, uh, one more piece of context: the province is um, currently conducting a mandatory five-year review of Nova Scotia aquaculture regulations. So this is a review that's uh, um, about a year overdue at this point. Uh, it's called for under the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act, which govern aquaculture regulations in the province. Um, and, uh, you know, this gives us an avenue to try to bring um, some of the lessons we've learned and, and some of the concerns that communities have um, with the aquaculture review board process and with the regulatory system more generally uh, into the public discourse hopefully um, hopefully, and hopefully an option for a change for the better. Um, so uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it off to our panelists to, to kick off opening statements. So again, this will be anywhere from three to five minutes uh, per person, and we will um, dig into the Q&A after that. Uh, so first up, passing it back to Derek Purcell with Twin Bays Coalition. Thank you, Simon. Just to pick up on uh, your introductory remarks with respect to the ARB, this was indeed precedent setting. When we set out to write our HBN Healthy Bays Network intervener application, the only thing that we knew for certain was that we knew very little about how the ARB would function. So I'm gonna to touch on two of those things. Um, the first uncertainty is, or for us was how formal would the hearing be? Put another way, would I be comfortable representing Twin Bays Coalition views as an intervener during the hearing? And looking back on the Rattling Beach uh, event, while I would be very comfortable with the material, I think the very formal nature of the legal proceedings would have been stretching most people's comfort zones. Legal representation is not required, but without it, both the ARB and the intervener would likely get frustrated. Any idea how much legal representation costs? Quite a bit, unless you are so very fortunate to obtain the services of EcoJustice, East Coast Environmental Law, or other similar organizations, which is why Twin Bays Coalition pointed this out to the Law Amendments Committee on 25th of October, 2021. We stated the Bill 24, which was to enlarge the size of the Aquaculture Review Board to a maximum of 10 members. That action gave the minister the power to effectively crush any public opposition to open net pen fin fish applications by allowing multiple hearings to occur simultaneously. This would instantly overwhelm the limited options reasonably available to local voices to ensure a level playing field at these ARB hearings. More recently, Twin Bays Coalition sent a letter suggesting that government funding be made available to interveners to offset legal costs. The feds do this with the public participation program. Why not the province? The second uncertainty I'd like to touch upon is that we believe the 
Aquaculture Review Board took a significant leap in describing the issue before them. The operator's application reads, quote, we are requesting a boundary change to reflect the location the farm has been in for the last 15 years, unquote. In our opinion, the Aquaculture Review Board was narrow-minded, short-sighted, and not acting in the interests of coastal communities when they stated the issue at hand as being, quote, what impact will the proposed boundary amendment have in considering the eight factors set out in section three of the aquaculture license and lease regulations? The operator's request appeared to not only be self-incriminating, but also opening the door to table evidence in support of that incriminating interpretation. And by that, I mean evidence alleging wrongdoing on the part of both the operator and government. This should have been a reasonable assumption since the Aquaculture Review Board is established under the Public Inquiries Act with most of the normal powers bestowed upon the commissioners. At the very least, we expected that there would be some level of accommodation for that line of argument, if only to prevent future occurrences of the conduct if the allegations could be proven. No such luck. We think that the issue at hand as written by the ARB which is what impact will the proposed boundary amendment have in considering the eight factors. Uh, if that interpretation had been made public when the hearing was announced, it would have saved us a lot of time and effort because we would have seen that the approval was preordained and that there was zero interest in hearing evidence relating to the conduct of both government or the operator. Now, each of these hearings will be different as we move forward. So we would urge the ARB to publicly state, if possible, the issue at hand when each hearing is announced. To conclude, we have learned a great deal from the Rattling Beach hearing, and this experience gives us a good solid footing to prepare for upcoming hearings. And we look forward to that opportunity. Thanks very much for your time and your interest. All right, that's great, Derek. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move uh, to our next panelist here. Uh, following up, Derek, is Karen Traversy. Thanks very much. Good morning again. The Association for the Preservation of the Eastern Shore applied for intervener status in the Rattling Beach Regulatory Review Board process, but was denied. So today, we would like to share with you our concerns about this first ever Nova Scotia Review Board hearing and our great disappointment that this new adjudicative process differs so much from the recommendations of the Dole Leahy Aquaculture Review in which we participated as members of the advisory committee. As we understood it at the time, the intention was to create an arm's length board which would hear citizen complaints about compliance issues and provide a way for local community members to share with the government their direct experience in living with these operations, thus building social license. Instead, what we got with this first hearing, essentially a ratification of an already existing boundary expansion, was a process with such a narrow focus that valuable input from coastal communities was significantly constrained. In this retroactive approval, the board has clearly sent a message regarding the possible outcome of four more of these boundary expansions up for approval, all involving the same operator. Our compliance concerns are not directly focused on the operator, but on the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture. These farms have been out of compliance with their legal boundaries for a number of years. In fairness, some of the delay in the review process can be attributed to the introduction of the new post dole Leahy legislation and regulation. However, this boundary creep expansion was intentional and benefited the operator. But where is the sanction by the regulator? Why the tolerance for such deliberate expansion? We feel strongly that compliance issues need to be addressed in a broader context by the board. This is based on our local experience with two salmon aquaculture farms on the Eastern shore operated by Snow Island Salmon at Owl's Head. 
These farms had numerous problems over their years of operations, including a die off due to super chill aggravated by too shallow water and insufficient flushing broken gear and difficulty in finding and retaining employees. The farm closed in 2013 and the company returned to Scotland, leaving the sites littered with derelict gear, including buoys, lines and concrete moorings. Community members alerted DFA, but to no avail. In 2020, these leases were renewed, presumably so they could be reassigned to a new operator, despite the fact that 42 organizations and individuals opposed the renewal. Community participants in the process only learned about the renewal three months after the fact. When asked about the delay, DFA said that time was required for the ex exchange of confidential information between them and the company, yet this lease involves public waters. Five months after the lease was renewed, our organization and others were forced to file a lease violation complaint with the Department of Environment. As a condition of lease renewal, the company was required to remove all gear related to past aquaculture operations by October 2020 and had not done so. So the work was finally completed just a few weeks ago by um, uh, months and months of follow-up by and tiresome pestering by community members. We wonder if the lease owner paid for the cleanup or the taxpayer of Nova Scotia. This is the kind of input we want to make at a Raffling Beach hearing if we were allowed. Aquaculture Review Board members need to have a realistic understanding of what can be expected of government compliance efforts in this so-called exemplary aquaculture regulatory regime. We feel this information is relevant to site expansions, including those that are after the fact. The people of the coast and our representatives want to bring our experience and knowledge of this industry forward, but we have been frustrated at every turn. These are public waters, and yet the voice of the public has been narrowly constrained. We want to talk about the risks that marine-based fin fish aquaculture pose to the very industries that keep our communities alive, the wild catch fishery, the lobster fishery, and tourism. We want to talk about species at risk that are affected by this industry and about climate change. We also want to talk about rural economic development that will take us into a sustainable and prosperous future. But most of all, we want to be involved in those choices, which include land-based and other alternative forms of truly sustainable aquaculture that do not pollute our bays. The government has been engaged in a very aggressive aquaculture expansion, including courting international companies, we don't want to be shut out of these decisions. Our experience has shown that once these pens get in the water, nothing will get them out, at least here in Nova Scotia. Certainly not boundary violations, or so it would seem. But in BC, citizens have demanded better. They have demanded that the federal government review, remove rather, fin fish farms from the Discovery Islands by 2025. And the federal minister has agreed. A legislative review of provincial aquaculture regulation is overdue, and the new minister says it is on his agenda. It certainly is on ours. One final note. We were surprised by the tone of the ARB's written report, which we found to be somewhat disdainful at times of the contributions of some of the participants in the process who are well-intentioned members of the public concerned about their environment. We felt this did not reflect well on the public, the provincial government. Thank you. Excellent, thanks so much for that, Karen. Um, next, we're moving to Brian Muldoon with Protect Liverpool Bay. Brian? Good morning, everyone. Uh, Brian Muldoon with Protect Liverpool Bay. Uh, after listening to the decision from the first Agricultural Review Board, it is clear that, um, and our feeling is that Minister Craig must be embarrassed from that report. Um, it, this ARB has to be dismantled and reviewed and put together properly in order for any regulations to move forward. Here in, particular, here in Liverpool Bay, we have a current um, open pen fish farm that is operating illegally outside its lease. It has, currently has 400,000 fish here. Um, if this uh, application goes forward, 
Um, and if it's reviewed, anything like the uh, Aquaculture Review Board, Liverpool Bay will have almost 2 million fish in net pens, 60 net pens in our shallow bay, which is only 18 meters deep. If it is allowed, this fish farm will actually be placed on top of where our local lobster fishers lay their spring traps. We have an, uh, a pristine beach here, just meters away from the current open pen fish farm. We are surrounded by environmental significant wetlands and we also have species at risk. And none of these factors, the coastal communities, they're not listening to us. And I, I beg the media to go to the government of the day. I'm holding a press release from our MLA in July that said, when she was uh, running for PC government, it, Kim Mazin said, quote, it is absolutely crucial that we get this right said Queen's candidate Maslin. The PC plan will protect the environment and the livelihoods by filtering out projects that don't meet strict scientific standards. Please make the government accountable and transparent. We need to maintain Nova Scotia as an ocean playground for tourism, not for open net pen fish farms. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. Um, next up, uh, Gwen Wilson with the St. Mary's Bay Protectors. Gwen? Uh, thank you and hello again. Um, as was already stated, uh, St. Mary's Bay Protectors had applied for intervener status along with the help of EcoJustice and we were denied uh, participation in that process. Uh, mainly because it was felt that uh, being residents of St. Mary's Bay, we did not live in the area rattling beach close enough to it to be directly affected by the operations there. So that was a very disappointing uh, decision to be, uh, to feel that we had been denied our voice and uh, reflective of the attitude towards social license from citizens of Nova Scotia and their uh, opinions about what ought to be able to go on in the public waters of the province of Nova Scotia, of which we are all citizens. And our attitude in St. Mary's Bay Protectors is, although we focus on St. Mary's Bay, as citizens of Nova Scotia, we are impacted by any kind of operation that goes on in any of the waters around our province. In particular, uh, coming back to St. Mary's Bay, uh, we did experience success with social license in the defeat of CIRMAX operations here. At least that was certainly how we felt about it at the time. I have to say that at this point, I'm not quite so sure if that's really why CIRMAX withdrew, but we were certainly able to mount a very active and vocal opposition to the project at the time, which would have put huge pressure on our Bay. I can echo the comments that Karen Traversy, Traversy made about the pressures that these kinds of operations put on our local bays in terms of the effect that they would have with you. If you imagine 24 pens in St. Mary's Bay, another shallow bay in the province, uh, right in the middle of where the, our lobster fishery uh, occurs. And in fact, our lobster fishery is, is in full swing right now in these waters. And now we find ourselves also impacted by a new operation, Canadian Salmon, which has been exploring the St. Mary's Bay for options to put in their 24 pens for over the last several months. Only very recently uh, was this former numbered company, uh, had did this former number company become known to us as the Canadian Salmon uh, Limited and their public hearings, <laughs> if you could call them public hearings, have been reduced to two uh, online events, which are occurring next week on February 7th and 8th, and their option uh, ends on February 18th. We had a long time in this process when we were dealing with CIRMAC, but what we don't have that same window of opportunity to mount the kind of public support that we did then. Uh, the hearings that are going to be held again, are not the kind of hearings where most people in this area find comfort in participation. It's a, a webinar 
90 minutes in the middle of the lobster season. So the people who are most affected by these kinds of operations are not likely to be able to have the time to participate. Uh, with this uh, new Norwegian company coming in, again, it puts increased pressure on our bay. There are a lot of other aquaculture, uh, shellfish operations in the bay. We have clamming in the bay. Uh, we have uh, other, other fish farms, cooks down on the islands. And there, as was already stated there, lease uh, has been operating outside the terms of its lease for several years. And we expect the same kind of decision when those op uh, operations come up before the ARB. So for those reasons, we uh, would like to be able to feel that the process is transparent and inclusive and that social license plays a much larger role than it apparently appears to be in the current uh, situation. I recall a comment that was made by government earlier this year in relation to the operations uh, acting outside the, the boundaries of their leases. And that was no harm, no foul. Well, that's a pretty poor way, it seems to me, to evaluate the kinds of things that are going on in our waters. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gwen. Um, moving on to our next panelist here, we have Chris Hunter with the Atlantic Salmon Federation up next. Thank you, Simon. Um, ASF uh, was asked um, to be a, a witness at the ARB hearings uh, because of our experience and expertise on wild Atlantic salmon uh, and our knowledge on the interaction and impacts of uh, between open net aquaculture and wild Atlantic salmon. Um, so in preparation for that uh, testimony, um, we reviewed everything that is known was presented by the government and uh, by the proponent. Uh, and things that could be applicable in the literature um, to this particular site. We were able to draw a number of conclusions. We wrote up a report on that, uh, on that information and uh, John Carr, our VP of research, uh, was able to testify and uh, bring these uh, issues and concerns forward. Uh, before we get into the decision document, uh, a couple of things that did um, sort of stick out with uh, ASF uh, about the hearing. Uh, first off, we were very surprised that DFO was not present. Uh, DFO has a mandate and responsibility uh, for the conservation and restoration of wild Atlantic salmon uh, and the marine environment. Uh, instead of being present, uh, they chose to uh, provide a letter of advice, uh, which seemed to be inconsistent uh, and um, logically flawed with the CSAS advice uh, and the current recovery strategies uh, employed by DFO. Um, so we were disappointed that they were not there to, uh, to address those concerns uh, and speak forward. Uh, our second impression was is that the ARB was a very legal and formal process, and it was not uh, very accessible uh, to the members of the general public. Uh, as we've heard a few times today already, the formation of the ARB was recommended by the Dolehi report, specifically so that communities and individuals would be able to have greater say in what goes on in public waters and for them to be able to get involved in licensing and leasing regulation and uh, uh, sorry, decision-making uh, around aquaculture operations in those public waters. That uh, process does not seem to, this process does not seem to meet that objective. Um, it was also kind of unusual that during this process, no one was present to actually speak up on behalf of the environment uh, and um, wild Atlantic salmon in particular. Uh, that duty uh, fell to interveners uh, and to nonprofit organizations such as the Atlantic Salmon Federation. Um, that seems unusual that, uh, and then you made the process, as we have also heard today, that that process to become that, to become an expert witness or to become an intervener was quite difficult. Um, so that seems to be set up backwards in our minds that that burden should be on the government and the proponent to demonstrate that the uh, operation would not have an impact on wild Atlantic salmon and the environment. In looking at the uh, decision uh, put forth by the ARB, um, we were very disappointed. Um, there were a number of cases where there seemed to be um, misrepresentation of the conversation that happened during the ARB, uh, or at least uh, cherry picking of, of different arguments. Uh, they stated that we did not provide evidence per pertinent to this site, yet in their decision, they provided acceptance and support for the proponents claims of no impact, 
and the government's claims that uh, paper regulations, uh, the regulations on paper would be able to address any potential impacts if they did exist. We provided evidence um, that demonstrated uh, that uh, that was not the case, yet that was not reflected in the, uh, in the actual decision document. When we, we look at um, the facility, uh, you know, and the, we were able to conclude that there are impacts that are likely to occur uh, and that the regulations uh, do not uh, adequately address them. With an endangered population, to us, this does not seem like an acceptable risk. We were under the impression that the whole purpose of sending these lease violation cases to the ARB was to have an independent review of the impacts that the expansions are having on the environment and wild Atlantic salmon by operating beyond their boundaries. Given the testimony provided by the proponent, it is clear that is also what they thought the point of the hearing was. And in their decision, the ARB recognized that that was what ASF and Cook were presenting on. Yet they chose instead to only look at this in the context of, as they said it, moving lines on a map and not relating moving lines on a map to the actual expansion that they are retroactively uh, making legal. If it was to be the case, as Derek said earlier, that the ARB was only going to look at moving lines on a map and not consider the ramifications of moving lines on a map, then to us, we call into question then what was the point of actually going through the whole process of the ARB uh, and actually presenting evidence on the impacts or on, on any of this. If it's just simply moving lines on a map, then uh, there's no possible way moving an arbitrary line on a map uh, can reflect and, and have an impact. So we could have, we didn't have to go through this whole process. It just seemed to be kind of a dog and pony show uh, to make it look like these things were being considered. It certainly seems to defeat the purpose of the ARB. Now the current government has promised to review the ARB and they have promised to improve licensing and regulatory process to ensure that environmental and community concerns uh, are going to be specifically addressed by the new process. We are thankful for this and we are looking forward to working with the government to try and improve the system because from where we stand, this current system simply does not work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, finally, to round out our presentations, Sarah McDonald with EcoJustice. Thanks, Simon. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, as others have expressed today, EcoJustice is, of course, uh, very concerned about the ARB's decision for a number of reasons, uh, many of which have, have been addressed in some fashion by the other panelists today. Um, but before I get into those issues, uh, the ones that have been referred to already and that I think are top of mind for many of us, um, I would just like to make a couple of brief remarks about the duty to consult, which was uh, a significant portion of the board's decision. Um, as I'm sure everyone knows, the board found that the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture, DFA, did not have a duty to consult affected Mi'kmaq communities about the, the lease expansion at Rattling Beach. Um, not only is that legally incorrect in my view, but uh, I would suggest that it is appalling that DFA could avoid its constitutional obligation to consult with First Nations by tacitly allowing Kelly Cove to complete its, ex its expansion before going through the required application process and then retroactively claiming that the lease expansion won't have any impacts on Indigenous rights. Um, so EcoJustice stands in solidarity with Bear River First Nation and with all others who are fighting to ensure that DFA respects their constitutional rights to be consulted on, on these kinds of aquaculture projects. Um, in terms of the remainder of the decision, I think there's certainly quite a bit for coastal communities to be concerned about. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just sort of quickly review a couple highlights or, or maybe lowlights um, and we'll be happy to discuss uh, at more length if, if there are questions for me. Um, so first of all, as others have sort of referred to already, the board is pretty clear throughout its decision that it's distrustful of anyone who has expressed an opposition to open net pen aquaculture 
in the past or who is even affiliated with groups that have opposed open net pen aquaculture. Um, Throughout the decision, the board uses this to dismiss evidence from the intervener's witnesses and from members of the public, uh, even where that evidence is directly relevant to the site in question, Rattling Beach in this case, and even where that evidence was unchallenged by the other parties. Um, so I think that's concerning for groups who are considering, uh, and individuals who are considering engaging in this type of process moving forward. In pretty stark contrast to its treatment of the intervener's witnesses and members of the public expressing concern about the project, the board interpreted the evidence put forward by the other parties, uh, being Kelly Cove and DFA, in an extraordinary, extraordinarily positive light, uh, particularly when it came to the long history of lease violations at the site. The board sort of characterized that history as being an innocent mistake. Uh, despite significant evidence to the contrary. Um, so clearly the board was willing to give DFA and Kelly Cove significant leeway um, in contrast to the intervener. Um, and just lastly, in terms of impacts to wild salmon, um, as those who have read the decision will know and as Chris um, referred to, the board rejected the argument that the expansion should not be approved if DFA and Kelly Cove cannot show that it, it's not having harm or not causing harm to local wild salmon populations. Um, our argument or the argument put forward by the intervener had been that because there's no monitoring going on of local wild salmon populations, which are critically endangered, um, we can't say for sure whether or not the site is having an impact and it should be the responsibility of DFA and the proponents to conduct that sort of monitoring. Um, the board, of course, rejected that argument and in doing so essentially imposed a burden on groups and communities concerned about open net pen aquaculture to produce positive evidence of impacts to wild salmon, which is a huge hurdle in the absence of any monitoring by government authorities or by industry. Um, it essentially means that communities who want the board to take the industry's impacts on wild salmon seriously um, would have to figure out how to do their own monitoring and present that kind of evidence to the board, which is, which is a huge hurdle in terms of resources and expertise, et cetera. Um, so in essence, the ARB's first decision on a salmon aquaculture application has already erected significant barriers to effective participation by those concerned about this industry um, and uh, EcoJustice certainly looks forward to participating in the regulatory review process that uh, we hear will be commencing shortly. All right, thanks everyone. All right, thank you very much, Sarah, and to all our panelists. So that's kind of a broad overview of um, thoughts and feelings in relation to the Aquaculture Review Board decision, as well as the broader context uh, of aquaculture around the province at the moment. So with that, um, I would like to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, I have a few here to get things started. Um, we have a question here first from John Cascadden um, as well, and then Paul Withers with a hand up. So I'll just go to John's question first. Why is land-based fish farming not accepted and regulated as the safest and preferred method for fish farming? Why not make this the only allowed method for Nova Scotia? Um, maybe I'll... Pass. Does anyone want to? Does anyone want to take that one on, or should I pass it to somebody here? Oh, I can make a comment on that. Go for it, Derek. Profit. That's why, because you know, back in 2012, I think an analysis revealed that the operation of open net pen fin fish aquaculture yielded the operator in the vicinity of a 50% profit, whereas land base, of course, you have more infrastructure higher costs, your profit margin will go down. How far down? Don't know, because nobody's done the analysis. So I think it's the way of the future, John, but we're taking real small baby steps headed in that direction. Okay, thank you, Derek. Um, we'll move to Paul Withers next. Uh, Paul, we should be able to hear you now if you're speaking. Hey, I'm speaking now. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm just, uh, I understand the reservations about the, uh, about the ARB process, et cetera, but I'm wondering uh, whether this is a, a circle that you will ever be able to square. And I, I say that in connection with all four Atlantic provinces have signed an MOU uh, about aquaculture in which they say that uh, it is uh, not only uh, legitimate, um, uh, it is also environmentally sustainable. Uh, and I just don't know whether or not um, arguments about the process uh, of a regulator can get past the fact that the stated policy position of the provincial government here is to promote aquaculture. Great point. Who wants to take that one on? I do. Okay, Derek, have at her. So, Paul, if you look at the map of Southern Coast Newfoundland and the number of aquaculture operations that are there presently and planned, it's astounding. And we've been privy to some conversations in Newfoundland and Labrador with respect to the establishment of bay management areas, which is basically a way to manage these huge numbers of, of operations so that they don't interfere with each other in terms of pest control and disease spread and pollution. So, you know, that's the way forward that Nova Scotia sees. Is that what we want for our coastal communities? We don't think so, but you're absolutely right. How do we, how do we make that argument? And one of the ways to make that argument, I suggest, is to look to South Coast Newfoundland and say to the government, is that really what we're aspiring to? Is that what we see as our future? And, I can uh, comment as well. If, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Sarah, by all means. Sure. Um, I would just say that I think the notwithstanding the question of whether um, you know, we want salmon aquaculture in Nova Scotia at all, um, there are significant benefits to be gained by improving the regulatory system for, for that industry um, and by ensuring that the government regulator is operating in a transparent and effective manner. Um, you know, EcoJustice certainly has concerns about the industry as a whole, but we think that there's still um, value in making efforts to improve the way that it's regulated. And certainly, you know, we have pointed already in this panel to a number of problems with the way that aquaculture is regulated in Nova Scotia. Um, and I think that, you know, um, that improving improving that regulatory process, including the application process, uh, is a benefit to us all, even if it doesn't mean that the industry is going to leave the province. And uh, I just, on, on the suggestion of our silent panelists here, would like to see if uh, Chris would, wants to comment on that in the context of the East Coast Coalition for Aquaculture Reform and the group that's developing there. S certainly. Um, so, um, you know, uh, in, in response to your question, I mean, you know, certainly um, we've got environmental concerns. Um, the responsibility uh, for conservation uh, of our marine species, uh, such as the Atlantic salmon, you know, clearly rests with the federal government. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we are a firm believer that if they become more involved and, and, and take on and do the job that they are supposed to be doing, as we are seeing them do out on the West Coast, um, that that's going to change the conversation. Um, that's going to change the, uh, the dynamic uh, in terms of how we go about uh, regulating this industry. Uh, and then that factors into how the governments, uh, the different maritime Atlantic provinces are going to factor in uh, their promotion of it. Uh, we've got community groups uh, and um, uh, companies uh, that are actively looking at alternatives that are much more sustainable, that uh, have social license. Um, and um, so as those are developed uh, a long time alongside this changing regulatory regime, uh, we really see that there's going to be a change in how this industry is regulated and promoted. Um, because you know the true cost benefits, which right now are not all the cost of the environment, are not being factored into these economic considerations. Uh, once they get factored in, I think that will severely change. Uh, and so, you know, that's something that ASF is working with community groups to do. Uh, that's why we work with the Healthy Bays Network. 
Um, and we are similarly working now with a coalition uh, that sort of uh, spans a much broader range across the East Coast, the East Coast Coalition for Agriculture Reform, to kind of take that conversation to the federal level uh, and helpfully share resources between the provinces so that we can kind of make these sort of arguments uh, and really make this clear um, to the different provinces and to the federal government. Okay, great, Chris. And we have another one uh, for you here from Leslie and Ethan with the Halifax Examiner, uh, wondering if you can go into more detail about the impacts um, the farm could have on wild salmon if the kind of monitoring uh, you'd like to see were taking place. So um, the, the scientific evidence uh, has been reviewed by, by a number of different uh, parties. Um, and uh, it's actually been very nicely summarized at the North Atlantic uh, Salmon Conservation Organization or NASCO. And they've developed um, guidelines for you know, how open net pen aquaculture should be operated. Um, in conjunction with all of the the governments, uh, this is a this is a you know uh, international effort, um, and it, it kind of lays out what really should be happening in terms of um, impacts and and how those should be. And so the couple of the without going into all of the the conclusions, uh, the NASCO and, and we presented this at the ARB, the NASCO uh, recommendations are that you know there should be uh, zero escapes from aquaculture facilities and no impact from disease uh, such as sea lice or, or, or other diseases um, on wild Atlantic salmon. Th that is the benchmark that should, should be present and that governments have agreed to that they should be working towards. Canada has received a failing grade uh, on the progress that it is making uh, with respect uh, to achieving those goals. So that is something that, uh, you know, that, that's where the goal, the, the standard is or where we should be working towards. Um, we are clearly not there yet. As we presented at the ARB, um, even with these regulations, and in fact, if you look at Maine, which has better um, escape management regulations than is being proposed for Nova Scotia, um, they, with their monitoring, were routinely finding unreported escapes. In, Nova, in uh, the Maritimes, we routinely find unreported escapes at the one river where we actually do monitoring, which is the McAdavid uh, in New Brunswick. And we're also finding escapes even when we're not looking for them, such as been recently found on the Gasparo River. So, you know, clearly there is an impact having. Uh, the call that we made at the ARB said, yes, you know, thank you for attempting to improve the regulations. That is a positive step forward. We acknowledge that. But at the same time, you know, they don't go far enough. And we clearly need to be doing more monitoring to ensure that, you know, that they are effective. This idea of, you know, not looking and then saying everything is okay, turning a blind eye is, uh, is just not good enough anymore. So, you know, that, that's kind of, we have our target that we're going towards. Uh, and that's why we see, you know, there needs to be more monitoring. There needs to be more uh, proper evaluation of the impacts uh, to ensure that um, we have an accurate reflection of what's going on. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Greg Mercer here, also with a hand up. Greg, if you'd like to uh, ask your question verbally, you're more than welcome. Sure, yeah, can you hear me, Simon? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's just a question about how this issue is different in Nova Scotia than it might be on the West Coast. And it's, it's a question about provincial versus federal jurisdiction. And I'm trying to explain to people how concerns around um, expansion in the industry uh, maybe more challenging or, or may play out differently here where, where, again, it's the province making these decisions and not the federal government. And I don't know who can best answer that. Maybe I can pitch that one to Karen if you are interested in taking that one on. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, it, it's a rather complex uh, situation um, and uh, it, the Actually, the fundamental difference is that the federal government has much more of a role in uh, aquaculture management in British Columbia than it does on the East Coast. And one of the reasons was for that was that Alexander Morton and a, 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 was a person who's been trying to fight against these um, um, open pens for such a long time, launched a legal um, uh, challenge in the courts to establish whether um, uh, uh, 
it was a fishery, an aquaculture uh, operation, whether that was a fishery under the Fisheries Act. And that distinction is an important one because then it has a lot to say about the jurisdiction that applies to who should be running the show on the regulatory side. And so the federal government had to step back in and do more in BC than they had before, and they still retain more of a role. That's why you see the headlines coming from BC. And there also, the Aboriginal community has been very much uh, involved in, in aquaculture, and they basically have a lot of concerns about all of the impacts of the wild on wild salmon in the Discovery Islands. In Nova Scotia and in the Maritimes, uh, Prince Edward Island is different again um, uh, due to sort of uh, history, I suppose. But uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Newfoundland. Um, the federal government basically has these memoranda of understanding for the administration of regulation pertaining to aquaculture, and um, they delegate that via an administrative delegation to the provinces. However, there are those who feel that they are abrogating their obligations in that regard. Yeah, and I would just uh, add to Karen's point there by saying that it's very difficult for us to get any traction with um, protections against open net pen aquaculture um, for wild Atlantic salmon because we have provincial regulators that ultimately don't have a mandate to protect uh, wild Atlantic salmon, uh, whereas the federal government does. And uh, I know Chris can speak to that in some detail. Um, I do want to uh, just check and see uh, if that's a, a new hand from Paul Withers or uh, the same hand that was up before, um, before moving on to further questions. Paul, did you have another one? That looks like maybe not. How's that? There we go. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. So um, I just want to take someone to the uh, to a couple of points. One is that uh, the the suggestion here is that the the exercise was bad faith on the part of the uh, of the regulator here. Um, but let's flip it around. What if what was what they were doing was in good faith? That in fact uh, the uh, the concerns that have been raised this morning were actually overblown or overstated, as they said in their decision. Um, and I, I want to ask a, a bit about. Well, we haven't seen the horror shows in Nova Scotia that we have seen, as Mr. Purcell referred to, in, in Newfoundland with massive die-offs, et cetera, uh, here. Um, as a devil's advocate question, maybe Cook is doing a, a relatively good job, and that was reflected um, in this decision. Well, I, I can speak to um, our perspective on that at the Ecology Action Center first before passing it off again. Um, our issue in this case is uh, our issue with the Aquaculture Review Board in, in any case, and, and what we saw at the hearing is not necessarily with the company per se, but um, with the way that the process is, is set up at the moment. Um, you know, there was a lot of insulation uh, but, uh, from scrutiny uh, at the provincial level. Um, we saw the province sort of um, pushing to ensure that enforcement capacity and regulatory uh, capacity um, in the past could not be challenged during the hearing. We do think that's like a, a major problem. Um, also, also uh, you know, when it, comes to, when it comes to the company operating in, in good faith uh, and we saw the board sort of relying on, you know, mitigation measures that they put forward to validate a lot of the uh, decision. Um, it's a huge issue if we can't if we can't ultimately investigate, um, you know, what's gone on in in the regulatory functioning of the system in the past. And uh, you know, maybe I can toss this to Sarah as well because that was, of course, a big part of um, eco justice engagement um, within the hearing. Uh, do you care to comment at all, Sarah? Sure, I can comment. Um, from our perspective, the issue about uh, and Paul, I assume that you're referring primarily to sort of the boundary violations mm -hmm. and the fact that, that Cook has been operating significantly outside of its lease for quite some time. Um, the issue for us in terms of Rattling Beach was largely about the precedent that it sets for the other sites that are also operating outside of their lease boundaries. 
including the other site in the Annapolis Basin, including the site in St. Mary's Bay, including the Coffin Island site in Liverpool Bay, and the Saddle Island site. Um, although there have not been any reported issues with the Rattling Beach site in terms of pollution or impacts to wild salmon, although of course, as we've discussed, they're not looking for those impacts. Um, there have been reported issues with the other sites, the Coffin Island site in particular, and the Saddle Island site. And, um, and it's important for us that the regulator set a precedent um, of, of enforcing what should be you know, pretty easy to enforce, uh, the, least, the least boundaries, especially when the uh, violations are so egregious. Um, and although we don't necessarily have, I mean, notwithstanding the salmon issues that we've already discussed, we don't have um, other functional issues to point to at the Rattling Beach site. Uh, it certainly sets a poor precedent for enforcement of lease boundaries at other problematic sites. Um, and I mean, certainly sets uh, a poor precedent in terms of transparency and um, social license for this, these kinds of operations. Yeah, and I think I think again, just to reiterate, you know, we're interested in, in regulatory systems that are going to make environmental protection stronger in the water, and that are going to uh, make life easier in dealing with fish farms for communities, um, not not simply uh, functions that are going to put uh, people through, you know, largely bureaucratic processes that, as Chris alluded to, ultimately result in the redrawing of lines in the water. So again, hopefully, something we can address in the upcoming regulatory review. And uh, Chris, you have a hand up. You like to comment on that as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, part, part of Paul's questions and, and it was probably in, in direct response to some of my comments. So um, I wanted to say that, you know, th these expansions, uh, they go back a, a long, long time that they've been operating outside their boundaries for a very, very long time. Uh, well before, you know, Dolehi and, and, and the recommendations in the current regulatory regime. And so as these, you know, have been looked at over the last number of years, the last say five or six years, um, you know, the government had to make a choice as to how they were going to address these, these issues. This isn't a, a single case. As, as we've heard, there are many cases around the province where we have sites operating well beyond their boundaries. Um, they could have chose to grandfather them in. They could have chosen to um, you know, simply make the amendments through an administrative review handled entire, entirely by uh, the NSDFA. Instead, they, they made the conscious choice to send it to the ARB for review. Uh, for us, the, you know, and uh, as I said, I think based on the evidence presented by the proponent themselves, you know, this was a clear signal that they were not just looking at this as a moving uh, on lines on the map, that they were actually looking for to see, let's go retroactively and say, okay, if we're going to move the lines on the map, we need to look at the, at the expansions that occurred and the impacts that they're having. Now, as, as Sarah pointed out, that's really difficult, you know, once it's already happened to go back and say, well, what you know what would have been there had that expansion not occurred so it certainly was not a, an open and shut case um you know and we respect that there would be some difficulty in reviewing that decision but the tenor of the language in the decision and and certainly you know the uh, um the response certainly does not did nothing to indicate that that was the intent that it was going to the arb specifically to look at the expansion uh and then you know as a way to kind of say, if we're going to allow these lines to move, that that is the result, you know, that we're looking at the expansion as part of that. So the fact that that was separated out, and as I said, the language in the decision document, um, that's what leads to our, our, our comments about, you know, what, what was this all for if, if they were not actually going to be looking at this in a way. They, they had other options uh, where they could have addressed this. Um, I also wanted to address your comments about uh, Newfoundland. Um, so we do have, you know, some differences in comparisons. It's not a straight apples and orange comparison uh, in terms of the distribution of sites in Nova Scotia versus the distributions of sites in Newfoundland. So there are some scale differences. But the other thing I would point out is, is that, you know, under our current regime, up until this ARB hearing, we were not getting any information about impacts. And it was only when something catastrophic occurred that we would hear about. And we did hear about that. We did hear about that, you know, with winter chill and, and there we have had fish kills and, and IHN uh, and IHV and various disease outbreaks occur in Nova Scotia that that made that I know you reported on and, and made made the media. Um, 
But it was only through the ARV process that, for example, that we learned that Rattling Beach had a history of sea lice issues and was in fact currently going through an outbreak of sea lice that they had to intervene and, and repeat on. So, um, you know, certainly the process that we have has not been very transparent. Um, and so to say that we haven't had the issues in Newfoundland, um, and I'm not suggesting that the process of Newfoundland is transparent, but, uh, you know, it, um, I think there's some a bit of a different comparison there and that we haven't had all the information provided to us uh, made public and we haven't certainly uh, we do have some scale different issues there so th those would be my comments um, to your questions okay thanks chris um i recognize we're now at 1205 so i do want to get people out of here in a relatively timely fashion we have one more um question here in, in the uh, q a so far so if anybody wants to get uh, sneak in a last uh, question uh, do it now or forever hold your peace. Uh, we do have one for Derek here. Um, I noticed you had a hand up just now, Derek. Um, uh, well, I say it's for you because it's in reference to Saddle Island off of Bayswater. Um, the question from Marvin asks, uh, I am led to believe that the Saddle Island site off Bayswater has two unlicensed sites. He says, who polices this industry, the ARB or DFO? Um, not only to move lines on the map, but to move the fish pens. Yeah, what Marvin is referring to is the fact that two of the cages are outside of the approved lease boundaries as reflected in their current lease uh, documentation. Uh, the province is aware of that. And uh, we actually have submitted a complaint um, to the enforcement branch of Nova Scotia Environment uh, regarding that uh, transgression. So that's in the process of investigation and we'll see what, what comes of that. Uh, and those are the people that are actually in, for, in charge of, uh, of enforcement for that particular matter. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Uh, we do not have any coming in from Facebook, I am told. Um, so if there are none further, uh, Derek, you, you wanna chime in on something else as well? Yeah, just to follow up to Paul's question and Chris's response in the tail end, I don't think anybody really disputes the fact that industry is trying to make things better. Okay, they've changed the types of net. I mean, I spent an hour at the Bayswater open house with Joel Richardson and Jeff Nickerson talking about aquaculture and their particular operation down there. It's clear that, in fact, industry is moving to try and mitigate some of these things. But the problem, Paul, is that they keep rolling out the fact that they're adhering to the regulations as written, which is good, except that the regulations as written are more permissive than restrictive. And we're of the opinion that they need to be more restrictive in certain ways. And that's really what we're, what we're pursuing here. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I would just, um, as a follow up to that, encourage everybody to uh, reach out to us, reach out to the Healthy Base Network. Um, if you're interested in this uh, regulatory review process that is supposed to take place at the provincial level, um, we're definitely planning to get engaged there. And um, Derek has, uh, Derek and, and a bunch of other folks in this group actually have set us up with some great material for um, potential changes that we could make to try to um, improve some of the issues that we've touched on today. Um, so please, please do reach out. Um, that is definitely part of the function of the Healthy Bays Network is to try to connect um, communities across uh, across the province and um, connect folks who are interested in um, seeing a you know a different, more sustainable, more regenerative, and ecologically uh, sound um, future for the aquaculture industry here. Um, we do have. Uh, we do have one uh, more thing that I'd like to get to before we uh, sign off here. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just quickly summarize a um, brief statement from Gregory Hemming, who um, some of you who are present at the hearing will remember as our, uh, the sole intervener um, in the Rattling Beach uh, Review. Uh, Gregory writes, um, this decision from the ARB is certainly disappointing. However, it was un unfortunately not expected. Their decision was simply wrong. They ignored Indigenous wisdom, First Nations land rights, and the rights of nature. It convoluted the precautionary principles so necessary to, to the survival of wild salmon, and most importantly, it legitima legitimized unlawful open net pen fish farming activities by ignoring the rule of law and sidestepping the department's own mandate of transparency and oversight. If enough community members join together in the struggle to save wild salmon, and if we continue to fund expert legal support organizations like EcoJustice, our future and that of wild salmon can be hopeful. We must give ourselves time to understand what it means to be salmon and what it means to be human. Uh, 
It is a path in which we must educate ourselves to be ecologically competent and compassionate in our lives and in our livelihoods. Um, so in uh, true Gregory Hemming fashion, uh, literary ecologist and writer, uh, I think that's um, a good note on which to wrap up this uh, virtual press conference and public panel. So uh, once again, um, thank you to all of the attendees, uh, to all of the question askers, to all the folks uh, on Facebook for being with us today. Um, if you have any questions um, on anything that you heard here, uh, we are here for you. Uh, please follow up. Um, you can get in touch with us on the Healthy Bays Network website. Um, we tend to do social media through the, the various community groups that are present here today. You know, Protect Liverpool Bay, East, uh, Association for the Preservation of the Eastern Shore, St. Mary's Bay Protectors, Twin Bays Coalition. If you live anywhere um, you know, along the fish farming coast of Nova Scotia, uh, you can find a Healthy Bays Network uh, group in your area. So we would definitely encourage you to um, get in touch. Uh, we're always looking for uh, keen observers and, and um, you know, people who are interested in this topic to, to do all kinds of things and get involved. Um, so without further ado, uh, and Janine, um, I'll second Janine's comment here in the chat. Thanks to everybody for your time and efforts on this. And uh, we will hope to encounter all, all of you folks again soon. Thank you.